Um, next, next on the list, who have we got? Ben. Ben Hansen, Senior Security Architect at Microsoft. So Ben, really excited for your talk. Really nice to meet you. Um, let me add your presentation to the stream. And we shall drop off and let you go. Thank you. Yeah, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you fine. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave the stream and uh, I'll let you crack on. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. I'm still cracking up, Francesco, from your, I think you said, don't use the tool or you'll be a tool. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. I've been laughing at that for a couple of minutes. So good stuff. Well, uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to speak to you guys um, from, well, it was sunny northern England. Now it's not. Um, I am, uh, as you said, I'm Ben Hansen. I'm a senior security architect at Microsoft. I've been with the company not very long, about three and a half years. Before that, I led the cyber and infosec practice for a management consultancy based on the U.S. East Coast, which is where I'm from originally. And before that, I had just a diverse 20-year uh, career, really, in various leadership roles as a technologist, as an enterprise architect, uh, business transformation. So I've, I've been to lots of talks. I've never seen one like the one I'm about to give. I hope it'll be uh, both informative and also interesting. So let's go. Um, they say... Ben, that it, uh, just, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so just a quick one. Uh, the voice is coming very, very cracking and, and digital. Uh, do you mind to... Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but otherwise yeah, yeah. we don't want to ruin your talk. Do you mind to disconnect and reconnect the, uh, just the audio? Yeah, how do I do that? Let me just see. Sorry for the technical difficulties, guys. No, no it's okay. I We're swore the kids off of, uh, no, I said no <laughs> Netflix, no TV streaming right now. So let's see. You could check their resiliency. Yeah. Let me try this. Is this any better? Can you tell a difference? No, no it's still... Do you, do you want to try taking out your head? Just um, can you run the audio just from your laptop? Just try without headphones. Or without let, headphones yeah, let me let me phone? let me try switching to the mic built into the camera instead of using. Can you hear me at all now? Is this any better? Yeah, much better. That's much great. Better. That's great. Thank you. Right, we're gonna we're gonna pop right. away. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Cool. And just get do do give me an interruption, please, if it's uh, if it's not good. Let me switch back to where I was. Great. Okay. Back where we were. You guys can see this, right? So um, we're going to be talking about something today that I've never seen before. I think it's a pretty interesting talk. I hope you'll find it informative. Um, they say if you if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. So I love history. I love learning from uh, historical figures and quotes from history. And that's actually what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at um, a number of quotes by a few guys. And the question really is, what do Eric Hoffer is a, is a philosopher, Winston Churchill, Charles Darwin and former NSA and CIA director Michael Hayden all have in common? And the answer, surprisingly, is that they had a lot to say about cloud security and resilience. We're going to actually start with a quote by the first guy here, American philosopher Eric Hoffer. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I love this quote, but it's a real mouthful. Have a look at this. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Wow. So what are we talking about? Now, I often work with customers that from a technology perspective are beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. I see this a lot, for example, in uh, SIEM and security analytics, um, working with customers that are trying to backhaul terabytes of data from their cloud environment into a traditional on-premises SIEM. But the focus here is really about cultural transformation. And the reason why is because all sustainable uh, ultimately, all sustainable transformation is a transformation of culture. It's tech-enabled, yes, absolutely. It's tech-empowered, tech-supported, absolutely. 
But businesses that struggle to drive change don't have a technology problem as the general rule. They have a culture problem. Now, I have a uh, love-hate relationship with this subject. I've worked with many uh, large multinationals, tier one systemic banks on cloud security strategy engagements. I always start here and it's always hard work. Um, culture is everyone's responsibility and no one's responsibility. Uh, tech, if you have a technology background, it's easy and fun to do that. Culture is hard work. But every single time I've given into the pressure, as it were, to move on to something more comfortable like tools and roadmaps, we always end up back here at the subject of culture. And that's because sustainable transformation uh, requires not just a transformation of technology, but it requires a transformation of people and process as well, the overall cultural ecosystem. And you simply cannot sustain transformation through tech alone. That includes cloud. <laughs> now, the most common uh, collision of cultures, as you could say, which trips people up most often that I see is this one. It's trying to operate with horse and buggy paradigms in a car world. Uh, now, I get it. Security organizations are in a transition between two worlds, one that they understood very well for the last 20 or 30 years, one that is very different. It has different risks. Therefore, it requires a different mindset, a different approach, different tools. But this has happened before. So if you go back to 1908, uh, the Ford Model T was hand built. It would cost you $825. Fast forward a few years, 1916, the Ford Model T was mass produced and the price had plummeted to $360. But the very first drive-in gas station didn't open until 1913 in Pennsylvania. So in other words, there was two seasons, two worlds in transition and conflict. And for a period of time, you had stables, but you had no gas stations. You had vets, but you had no mechanics. In other words, the technology was accessible long before uh, the organizations had created the mature ecosystems to support it. And this is actually the great benefit, but also the great risk of cloud. Businesses, security organizations, they adopt cloud before they've evolved the mature ecosystems to actually support it, to make the most of it, to sustain it, to get the full benefit out of it, including in the uh, security area, of course. So what happens is they end up going backwards to the world they understand. And they try to bring horse and buggy paradigms into a car world, and it just simply doesn't work. So how would you know? What are some of the signposts, some of the tangible ways that maybe you could tell? Well, if we use Hoffer's language from the learners um, versus the learned, uh, the learners are the ones who are embracing modern mindsets and architectures. They tend to have these things in common. First of all, they're cloud first and cloud native. Now, this doesn't mean cloud only. Cloud first and cloud native in this way is about an explicit, measurable, strategic intention. And this matters because it sets the boundaries for what is open for discussion and debate and what isn't. The things we're going to talk about and the things we're not going to debate. So uh, when a very large, very well-known tier one systemic bank here in Europe uh, decided that they were going to become a cloud-first, cloud-native organization. They said, explicit, measurable, strategic intention, they said, we are going to move 80% of workloads to the cloud in the next five years, including some core banking systems. They set the boundaries. The security organization was not empowered to change the target state. They were tasked to deliver it securely. But it started with an explicit, measurable, strategic intention. Another characteristic of learners, uh, organizations, security organizations that are adopting modern mindsets and architectures that I see, they adopt identity perimeter thinking. Now, in the digital world, identity is the key that unlocks all doors. Uh, if you own identity, you own everything, period, end of conversation. Now, it's not just about identity, of course. There are actually six pillars, uh, six domains, if you like, um, traditional organizations, Unfortunately, still many software vendors in uh, the security industry are still focused on the network domain. Now, 
Does it matter? Absolutely, it matters. But there's a big difference between the network, focusing on the network and the identity perimeter thinking. And you need a containment strategy. And what I see is traditionally is, is with modern mindsets and architectures, learner organizations, they have a containment strategy, which is oriented around all six domains. That's identity and networks, yes, but it's also data, infrastructure, devices, and apps. Another characteristics of learners is that uh, they tend to have security strategies that are driven from the top down and horizontally integrated across their organizations. Now, many traditional organizations start bottom up. In other words, they're very engineering driven. They're very uh, technology focused. They almost always have a best of breed mentality about uh, security technology, which means that they invariably struggle with tooling proliferation. They struggle with operational silos. Uh, many strategies um, within a traditional organization you find actually actively oppose one another. So not only they're not horizontally aligned, in other words, so you've got the network team creating a strategy over here that's pulling the organization in this direction. You've got the identity team creating a strategy over here that's pulling the organization in this direction. They're not horizontally integrated. Uh, modern mindsets and architectures, what you find is not only are they driving strategy from the top down, in other words, they can drive change in their business, but those different um, strategies are horizontally integrated with one another. So they're actually all pulling together the organization in the same direction towards business requirements and objectives. Another really common one that I see, big difference between organizations, traditional versus modern, information is protected everywhere it goes. Now, the belief that you can control where data goes is itself indicative of a traditional mindset because we both know that you can't. <laughs> it doesn't matter what kind of tenant restrictions you put on, what kind of DLP tools, your data is going to end up in places that you didn't intend. Now, for sensitive data in particular, in this day and age, you must be able to exert your will over your data. So you cannot find yourself in a situation where uh, that data ends out ends up outside of your traditional sanctioned channels and you have no ability to see it or government, govern it. You can't find yourself in that situation. And the last one, hallmarks of learners, modern mindsets and architectures is this one. Modern security organizations spend a lot more time and energy uh, focusing on preventing noncompliance rather than trying to discover it. The goal, of course, ultimately is preventing non-compliant workloads from running to begin with, and then shifting uh, your ability to detect that and discern that left into the CICD pipeline, even back into the development process. So what about you? You know, your organization, often traditional organizations operate around a gigantic list of controls. Um, at Microsoft, we do not introduce new controls into our software development lifecycle, security development lifecycle until and unless they can be highly automated or entirely automated, right? So modern organizations do not spend their time chasing around app and workload owners to try to get stuff compliant. They put guide rails in place that actually prevent non-compliance from beginning, uh, from, the, from, the, from the outset. Now this leads us to a really closely related cultural element. This is a, a quote here from Winston Churchill that I also really love. Churchill said, we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. Wow. So uh, Parliament in World War II, uh, the House of Commons had been bombed and Parliament was actually debating how to reconstruct it. You know, what should that reconstructed space look like? And semicircles were actually fashionable at the time in continental Europe and other places in Europe. Uh, the House of Commons, as you know, if you're not from the UK, the uh, MPs actually face one another, but semicircles were fashionable at the time. And Churchill actually said, no, the shape and the layout of the House of Commons is critical because that shape and layout is actually part of what shapes our culture. So in the House of Commons, you face one another, you see one another, you interact with one another. Uh, Congress in the U.S., for example, is a semicircle. So all of the representatives, the senators, they're sitting beside one another. They're not facing one another. And their attention is oriented to one point at the front of the room. Churchill said no. He said, no, I, the shape and the layout of the House of Commons is really important to the way it shapes the culture. Now, uh, a more familiar context for us would might be something like Conway's Law. If you've ever heard of that, there was a developer by the name of Melvin Conway in 1967. He said, 
organizations design processes and systems that mirror their own comp communication structure for good or for bad. <laughs> so that means that the effectiveness, the efficiency of your security organization will be heavily shaped by the functions and roles that you define and empower or not. So if your organization struggles with ivory tower thinking, fiefdoms, a lack of integrated end-to-end -end capabilities, integrated ways of working, you almost certainly have organizational structures and functional roles built around legacy paradigms and tools. Now we're often asked, I'm often asked by customers, what does a modern organization with modern security roles and functions look like? It looks like this. So first of all, at the top, of course, you've got your organizational leadership, your executive board, executive management team, setting the business model and vision. That drives down into the information risk management layer, which is where your security leadership comes in. And modern security leadership is really about enabling productivity and security. You can't do one or the other. You have to have both. And that's really their focus. That drives down into the third layer, which is the technical risk management layer. And there's a number of different parts to this. So one is compliance management. What are the compliance requirements uh, in your organization, the regulatory requirements? What are they? What, what are the ones you need to adhere to? And what is the current compliance status of those things? Another piece of this is security architecture. So uh, it's the understanding of the current state architecture, yes, but it's also the understanding of what is technically possible to design, implement, and enforce. Now, those uh, security architecture and compliance requirements are now implemented in production by specialists in each of these five functional areas. We, you can see on your screen, people-oriented areas, including insider risk, apps and data, infrastructure and endpoints, identity and keys, and OT operational technology. The security operations part, the security operations function of your business is a slightly separate animal, typically divided into two parts, a sort of proactive and a reactive part. The proactive part is about preparing for incidents before they happen. It's very much a part of an assumed breach mindset, which we'll talk about later. But also the reactive part, incident response, incident management. And you, you could really put threat hunting there as well as in, uh, I believe, in proactive incident preparation. The next section is around, next function is around threat intelligence. Now, threat intelligence is like the, uh, the nervous system of our body. So, so you can see on this diagram, threat intelligence is actually connecting to all the other parts. And threat intelligence is really about where you take lessons learned and you feed them back into each area of your organization so that you improve their ability to protect, detect, and respond your organization. So you're taking things that you learn about in your environment, you take things that you learn about from uh, other businesses, other things that are happening in your industry from a threat intel perspective, and you're ingesting that and you're feeding that out to all the other areas of your business so that you're improving their ability to do what they do to protect, detect, and respond to your business. Now, the last one is this one. It's the overlay on the five sort of operational functional layers called uh, posture management. Now, this is uh, the one that's newest it's the one that most commonly I feel like orgs really haven't grown into yet. They're not quite sure how to do this. Is this a security center of excellence? Is this giving people that already have IT operation functional roles, posture management instead? It's really not any of those things. So one of the strengths of the cloud is the ability to see how you're doing top down across all of your assets, right? This is one of the strengths of the cloud. Um, most importantly, then being able to take some of that posture information and using it as a feed into your things like access control decisions, uh, other controls around sensitive and critical assets. So this is posture management is a group of people whose job it is to keep their eyes every day, every minute on the security and the risk posture of the organization and act accordingly. So it's active governance of risk. Uh, posture management is not a side job for Jimmy on the help desk, <laughs> okay? It's not your identity guys doing something on the side. It's not the network guys doing their bit. No, this is about a group of people whose job it is every minute, every day to keep their eyes on the security and risk posture of the organization, active uh, governance of risk. Now, uh, you might have different, slightly different kind of functions in your organization, but there's really th three key questions to ask. Number one is, do you have these functions clearly defined and empowered? Do they interoperate and communicate seamlessly? 
And number three, do they have 100% visibility and control over the areas in their remit? Here's our third quote. This one is a real mouthful. So this comes from Michael Hayden. He's the former director of the NSA and the CIA. He said, fundamentally, if somebody wants to get in, they're getting in. Accept <laughs> that. What we tell clients is, number one, you're in the fight, whether you thought you were or not. Number two, you are almost certainly already compromised. Wow. So what is this about? Well, it's, it's about this. Assume breach. So our, our keynote today was talking about Star Wars. I'm going Lord of the Rings here. So assume breach. Assume breach is the one ring to rule them all. It's the one principle to rule them all. Now, uh, many of you will know that assume breach is one of the three pillars of zero trust. You've got assume breach, verify explicitly, and least privilege. But I would actually argue that this one is the parent principle. This is the one ring to rule them all. If you really operated from the perspective, the expectation that you were going to be compromised, then something like least privilege is something you would naturally do in terms of configuration in your environment because it's an effective way to limit blast damage limit blast radius to prevent lateral movement in, in your environment. So this really, assume breach really is the one ring, the one principle uh, to rule them all. And truly embedding assume breach is disruptive. It's disruptive because it completely turns traditional security priority models on their heads. So how so? Well, consider this question. Think of a sensitive or critical asset in your environment, code, app, data, whatever. If you operated from the expectation that an attacker was going to compromise it, what would you do differently to prepare than what you're already doing? Now, this slides, there's a lot going on in this slide. Don't let it distract you. All it's really showing is uh, uh, left to right a, an application development and deployment process with a number of different kinds of attacks. So here's the question. Here's what you really want to think about. What would you do differently to prepare if you operated from the expectation that an attacker was going to compromise your privileged identities, let's say, we'll start there. Okay. So that expensive privileged access management system that you've got, you know, it's the one designed to prevent people from accessing your privileged identities. Turn that on its head. Operate from the assumption that no, your privileged identities are going to be compromised and used against you. So what are you going to do to prepare for that? Would you even use that privileged access management system if you thought like that? Would you maybe repurpose your priorities in a way that might help you for when that happens, not if? Just a thought. What would you do different, differently to prepare if you operated from the expectation that your developer or your privileged admin ad, uh, uh, workstations or endpoints were going to be compromised? Uh, what about the authentication or auth authorization mechanisms? So we're back at solar winds now. So if you operated from the expectation that your federation infrastructure was going to be compromised and it was going to be used to mint golden sample tickets in your cloud environment, what would you do to prepare for that knowing that in advance? You probably would have better auditing and monitoring around the use of service principles in your account in your, your, your tenant or whatever cloud environment you're in. You probably would have better monitoring place to monitor when permissions were added to those service principles. These are things you might proactively do if you operated from the assumption that you were going to be compromised, not hoping that you wouldn't. Uh, what would you do differently if you operated from the assumption that your supply chain was going to be poisoned? So those of you that are doing artificial intelligence and machine learning, how would your data scientists approach their machine learning models if they operated from the assumption that the data they were using to train them was poisoned? Your source code, sensitive data being exfiltrated. So you see why it's so disruptive, but it's in a good way. It's the single most effective way that I can think of, the most effective principle that you can embrace with regards to your ability to protect, detect, and respond effectively in a modern environment. And that leads us really to uh, our last quote by Mr. Charles Darwin. Number four, sustainably resilient. He said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Wow. So uh, I often say that risk, strategy, resilience, those words are like Brexit. Everyone uses, but they mean different things by them. Uh, resilience is not about what happens to you. 
Resilience is about how you respond and recover from what happens to you. Sustainably resilient organizations transition away from a definition of success that means stopping bad things from happening. And they transition towards a definition of success that is about improving our ability to respond and recover when bad things happen. So what are some of the keys to sustainable security resilience? Well, first and foremost, it's helpful to understand the security organization's role in the subject of resilience. So the security organization does not own security risk. There's no such thing as security risk. Security risk is business risk, and it's owned by the same people that own all other business risks. The security organization's role is as a trusted advisor, an enabler, um, to educate, to inform the business about risk and how to manage it effectively. So in other words, we help you to be safe while you do the things necessary to make our business relevant and successful. So the very first key to sustainable security resilience is that security must be integrated, as the slide says, with business strategy, processes, and initiatives. Now, there are three keys kind of below this, three pillars, if you like. The first one is mindset, adopting a mindset that is assume compromise or assume breach, as we've already said, and focuses on ruining attacker return on investment by raising attacker costs. Now, what does that mean? So modern attacks are sophisticated, but they're not necessarily advanced. They, they, they almost always still exploit uh, the same basic vulnerabilities that they've been exploiting for the last 20 or 30 years. Attackers are opportunists. They don't invest time and energy in extravagant, elaborate attacks that might increase the likelihood of their discovery. Um, the Online Threat Alliance a couple of years ago did a study that said that 93% of attacks were preventable. So, so in other words, 93% of attacks are 100% preventable. And you raise attacker cost by doing two things. So the first thing is you break the known attack playbook. Now, I, I work all the time with customers that are obsessively focused on niche technology to address niche attacks, but they still haven't deployed multi-factor authentication. Despite the fact that depending on the study you read, 90 to 99 percent of commodity identity attacks are addressed by simply deploying multi-factor authentication. So the other thing in terms of raising attacker cost, breaking the known attack playbook, the other thing is excelling at rapid response and recovery. Now, if you adopt the Zoom breach against it, it's the parent principle. If you adopt a Zoom breach, you would naturally do these because you're not focused on the M&M &M anymore. You're not you're not the hard outer shell with the soft gooey center. OK, you're focusing on rapid response and recovery if you really take that principle to heart. The next one is cloud. Uh, now, fully adopting cloud is a key to sustainable security resilience. Now, I know I'm preaching to the crowd, uh, preaching to the crowd here, but why? So just because many businesses use cloud doesn't mean that they fully embrace the full security or innovation capabilities of cloud. You know, things like the crowdsourcing aspect, and we see all the time in our GitHub pages for our security tooling. Some of the coolest stuff with workbooks and automation and visualizations don't come from Microsoft. They come from the community that, that create this information and collaborate together on these things. The last one, of course, is hygiene. So um, addressing the hygiene issues that are almost always the cause of security incidents. Um, assuming breach-driven prioritization of that list, burning down the list, yes, but measured and reported at the highest levels, okay? So in Microsoft, we roll up to the corporate level and we report, for example, we know exactly what percentage of authentications are happening in our environment that are using legacy versus modern authentication protocols. So burning that list down, assume breach-driven prioritization, but measuring and reporting on it at the highest levels. And of course, adopting new key definitions of success is key for sustainability. We're no longer talking about just stopping bad things happening. We're talking about um, making sure that we can define new metrics of success, which is uh, how long it takes to discover things, how long it takes to recover when bad things happen. And so just, just to close with this closing thoughts, number one, collision of cultures. You can't become a butterfly by trying to be a better caterpillar. Have you established a mandate for change? Can you drive change through your organization? If not, what are you going to do about it? Number two, uh, form and function. Structure impacts effectiveness, perhaps more than we'd like to admit. Have you defined and empowered modern security roles and functions? Number three, adopt assume breach and embed it at all levels. It will revolutionize your security. It's the primary enabler for zero trust. And number four, 
cyber resilience in an assumed breach world looks different and it requires different definitions and measures of success. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that was entertaining. That's me. It was entertaining. Thank you so much. Actually, really, really enjoyable talk, Ben. Thank you so much. And I'll go away thinking about the Lord. Of, I love the Lord of the Rings reference as well. That was fantastic. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a really good <laughs> analogy, I have to say. Thank you so much. And like, you're perfectly on time. And I know there are questions for you, but we'll, we'll try and sort something out separately on that. Yeah. Um, do you have if, if anyone wants to, yeah, if anyone wants to hit me up on LinkedIn, yeah. feel free. If I, I'll go back and look at the questions on the on the feed as well and a, and answer them in YouTube. But hit me up on LinkedIn. We'll talk. Oh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much, Ben.